Harvard Divinity School. Psychedelic Spirituality and Race, February 17th, 2024. All right, well, welcome to our panel on psychedelic spirituality and race. Our talks today are going to explore how race and identity intersect with psychedelic spiritualities and how the field can work towards war equality and justice. Um, for me, this is something that's really special and exciting because my grandmother was a healer from northern Mexico, so when we're talking about um, different practices, this is something I get really excited about. Um, my name is Ginger. I'm an alumnus of the Harvard Graduate School of Education, and I'm a part of our talking group here, so I'm really excited to see this now coming into fruition. And my collaborator, Simon, and I, Simon's in the back, we're going to be doing the logistics of today's panel. And the talk's gonna range about 15 to 30 minutes. And to maximize the speaker's time, I'm going to provide a brief introduction and you can find their full bios in that digital program or you can ask one of us for one of the printouts we have for that lo longer bio. Um, and then for questions, we're gonna take them at the end to be able to maximize the time of our speakers. So without further ado, our first set is going to be a collaboration betwe between Yvonne Wussant and Candace Oglesby. Yvonne is an instructor in medicine at Harvard Medical School and an instructor in psychosocial oncology and palliative care at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. And Candace is the founder of Journey Mental Health Consulting and program director of Fluence Training's Ketamine Assisted Therapy Certificate Program. So please join me in welcoming Yvonne and Candace. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here with us today. We are so honored uh, to be talking about something so passionate with us. And so we're going to be talking about the interconnection of psychedelic spirituality, social justice, and BIPOC, which stands for Black, Indigenous, and People of Color, uh, engagement in psychedelic assisted therapy. And I think it's important for us to give you a little bit of context before we go into uh, this topic of discussion. So Yvonne and I met um, about three and a half years ago. We were both on a clinical trial that was studying psilocybin uh, with treatment resistant uh, depression and cancer patients. And so as I was invited into the space, I realized that I was the only uh, therapist of color in the space um, and that I was supporting a small percentage of participants of color. And so I had to ask myself, why am I the only therapist of color? in this space and so I started to share my concerns with any of my colleagues who would listen to me and so Yvonne was one of those colleagues and so we started to get curious, we started to question. I'm sure that I'm not the only therapist that's experiencing this, that's having a hard time to break through in the psychedelic therapy space. Even though this was an opportunity, there were still barriers. So <clears throat> on this clinical trial where Candace and I met, um, I was uh, um, in part, my, one of my role was to conduct a qualitative analysis of people's experience, participants in this clinical trial. So these were all um, cancer patients uh, with severe depression. And they were going through a one dose of psilocybin assisted therapy, uh, 25 milligram. And um, so I was interviewing them about two months after they, they had their journey with this uh, intervention. And um, here is what one said about her experience. She said, I cried the entire time. It wasn't sad or anything like that. It was a very beautiful experience. I just felt a wave of gratefulness and support. I had a group of women around me. They felt like my ancestors. They were supporting me and they were surrounding me. It was hundreds of people and they were supporting me. It was like they were having a celebration of me. My therapist was a black woman. This was Candace. It gave me another sense of reassurance there. A black woman would understand cert certain things that nobody else would understand. I didn't feel like I'm the only black person here and these people don't understand me and they're not going to know how to reassure me. So there is a lot here. There is both the healing, which is why, why I'm doing this work and what I'm hoping this work will uh, bring in the space of oncology and palliative care. And there is also the importance of uh, interpersonal relationship in this work. And for this person, the sense of connection and safety that Candace brought was for me like really eye-opening on this importance. But when I was hearing Candace 
telling me about her experience as a black therapist, I was like, wait, this is not just a discussion. Maybe we can research this more. Mm. So this is how um, we brought a team together. Uh, so we are very grateful to Dr. Justin Sanders, uh, who is a palliative care clinician at McGill, and Dr. Agrawal, who is an oncologist um, and founded Sunstone Therapies, which has provided funding for this, for this study and uh, Amani Ingram, who is our research assistant. And we really want to express a deep gratitude to the participants of the study that we're going to talk uh, about today. So today we're going to be giving you a little bit of an overview of historical and cultural background in terms of the psychedelic renaissance, um, psychedelic spirituality as a catalyst for black and brown therapist engagement, obstacles, also barriers that are faced by black and brown therapists, but also integrating psychedelic spirituality with social justice. We can't talk about one without talking about the other. So the, the simple fact that we are all here at the Harvard Divinity School today is a manifestation of the this psychedelic renaissance that uh, you know many have coined this reemergence of interest for psychedelic medicines and plants. Um, over the past decades, after 60 years of uh, prohibition, uh, there has been increasing research suggesting the safety and efficacy of uh, psychedelic acid therapy in a clinical context. Uh, there, there, there are like exponential number of trials of psilocybin and MDMA to name only the, uh, these uh, substances. And we may be a few months away from FDA-approved uh, medicines uh, with MAPS uh, filing MDMA for MDMA-assisted therapy to the FDA recently. And all this it belongs to the medical model of this renaissance is really the tip of the iceberg of what's going on. Uh, and I think we're going to hear more about all this today. Um, and so this, the hope is that it can foster some of the healing that we heard in the previous sli slide in many indications. Um, and there are many other concerns as well that we've heard um, and that Candace is going to tell a little bit more. And so as we talk about cultural humility and equitable access, um, psychedelic therapy is not just a novel concept, um, but has deep roots in indigenous heritage and living traditions. Um, it also provides promising interventions like psychedelic therapy equitably to diverse communities, uh, which requires a foundation of cultural humility and trauma-informed care. And then also the under-representation and mistrust so despite black and brown communities experiencing a disproportionate risk for conditions like post-traumatic stress disorder and depression, uh, they're significantly underrepresented in psychedelic clinical trials. And then also this underrepresentation is partially due to experiences of racial discrimination and trauma leading to valid mistrust or barriers related to psychedelic treatment, specifically as we look at U.S. history over in regards to clinical trials, Henrietta Lacks, MK Ultra, and Tuskegee Experiment as well. So also part of the background for our research, <clears throat> we had been in communications with colleagues from Emory University who um, surveyed the population of um, black Americans and white Americans to uh, explore their views on psychedelic acid therapies. So they had about half uh, of uh, both races. And um, they showed that uh, after a short education about what these medicines are, uh, black Americans demonstrated more positive views than white Americans about uh, their potential. And especially those who identify uh, a clinical need, a more important clinical need for themselves in terms of mental health. And so they concluded that the, the diversification of psychedelic acid therapy uh, is uh, the onus of the researchers more than uh, BIPOC people. Um, and so and in, in our study based on that, so that's the, the BIPOC communities, and in our study we focused on BIPOC therapists. Absolutely. And the curiosities that came up for us is what role do black and brown therapists play, and also what opportunities and barriers do they perceive to engage in psychedelic-assisted therapy? So 
to explore those questions, we uh, put together a mixed method uh, uh, study. Uh, we are going to talk of th about the qualitative approach today, uh, knowing that, that we just completed the, the qualitative phase of this study and we're gonna put together a survey, a national survey based on those results. And so the, the, the main objective is to explore um, BIPOC therapist perspectives on opportunities and barriers for them to engage in this field. We conducted semi-structured interviews and focus groups um, with a convenient sample that included a variety of therapists from different backgrounds, uh, research, non-research, different races, and different degrees of familiarity with psychedelic acid therapy. Uh, so we conducted individual interviews with 13 therapists and, uh, and focus group with 10. The mean age was 43 year old. There were 10 females, six males, six who did not identify as female or male. The distribution of races uh, is on this slide. Uh, and all our participants were practicing therapists in various settings. Well, so for the sake of our presentation today, we're only going to focus on three main areas um, or themes, shall I say, and the first being psychedelic spirituality as a catalyst um, to identify obstacles and barriers faced by black and brown therapists, and then what does integrating psychedelic spirituality with social justice look like? So... For the sake of this conference, we, we, we uh, asked ourselves, uh, what are we talking even when we talk tell about psychedelic spirituality? And we looked at this through a definition that uh, is widespread in uh, healthcare uh, that came from a, con uh, a cycle of con um, uh, consensus conferences uh, bringing together oncologists, palliative care researchers, spiritual care researchers, uh, philosophers and, and people from religion. And so they define spirituality as a dynamic and intrinsic aspect of humanity through which persons seek ultimate meaning, purpose, and transcendence, and experience relationship to self, family, others, community, society, nature, and the significant or sacred. And so what is psychedelic spirituality? Uh, for the sake of this research, we uh, consider maybe it's when spirituality is informed somehow by psychedelic experiences. And so when we talk about psychedelic uh, spirituality as a catalyst, uh, psychedelic spirituality serves as a driving force uh, for black and brown therapists to be able to enter into this field. And what that looked like was acknowledging a purpose or something greater than themselves. And then also the concepts of interconnectedness, unity, healing, trauma-informed approaches and empowerment are often emphasized with psychedelic medicine and serves as motivating factors for black and brown therapists to engage in psychedelic assisted therapy. So for our participants, what did this look like? Revolution. Psychedelics have the potential to challenge existing paradigms, including those related to race and spirituality, and offer new perspectives that may contribute to social and personal transformation. There was also this sense of collective liberation so not solely leveraging psychedelics for one's own personal liberation, but a shared collective freedom for all. And then liberation is interconnected. So this notion aligns with the understanding that addressing racial disparities and achieving social justice are all interconnected with spiritual and psychological growth. Oh. Uh, thank you. Yeah. So from one of our participants, I think there's a sense of this work being revolutionary and almost a responsibility in terms of making sure that our communities have a tool for personal liberation, individually and collectively. I think for me, at the end of the day, the opportunity for myself, the opportunity for the client, it just starts to blur and it's our collective opportunity to really meet ourselves. And another quote from one of our participants, um, but it says, I don't think we can really do this work if we've not had at least a few of our own experiences with the medicine. 
I find with my clients who are predominantly black, it just feels like I'm in community with them and I'm not over them. We're all in community together and healing together. It just brings a different type of connection. So <clears throat> this is the, the, the vision, the idea. And, uh, but there is also the, the reality of barriers faced by back for therapists when they're trying to, um, to enter this field and to uh, get training, get uh, involved in research, or uh, implementing their clinical practices. Um, and what we heard from them is that the barriers that they faced really feel disproportionate uh, because they are BIPOC therapists. Um, and that this really comes in tension with uh, the, those claims of psychedelic spirituality around interconnection, unity, trauma-informed approach. And, uh, and, but, but there is this reality uh, that we heard from our participants that they face barriers in uh, every dimension of the psychedelic field that is currently evolving. Uh, when they seek, seek out for training, uh, the cost of training, the location of training, the credibility, the sense of safety, like as a BIPOC therapist, it may feel much less safe to tell other people or people in my profession that I wanna commit to this field or that I wanna engage in this field. Um, than others, and, and several of them told us that how um, compl complicated it was to navigate this sense that it might not be safe for, or they might get some adverse consequences for engaging in the field. And then it's the, the psychological burden of engaging in this field uh, that is predominantly white, uh, that uh, often propose curriculum that are not really non-inclusive, when they're uh, not used uh, by tokenism or facing uh, racism. Uh, the clinical research uh, <clears throat> is mainly designed and implemented in uh, ways that were described non-culturally inclusive um, and uh, with underrepresentation of BIPOC investigators. Where are the BIPOC investigators in the current psychedelic research? Um, this trust for clinical research in the BIPOC populations were mentioned and an underrepresentation of BIPOC research participants, uh, of course, as a consequence. Um, in, <clears throat> in terms of clinical implementation, uh, participants describe a lack of job opportunities outside of research, uh, and although they mentioned ketamine as a way to engage in, in this research, uh, but also a lack of practicality of the job opportunities. Uh, Acknowledging that it's very much uh, a field that is developing and that most uh, of the access is through research and not really uh, uh, available. But beyond all that, there is um, this sense that BIPOC therapists don't really recognize themselves in the model that is being pro proposed mostly. Um, because it's a model that feels rooted in capitalism, in individualism and systemic oppression. And uh, this model is extractive with cultural appropriation and lack of reciprocity. And we've heard uh, a lot of that this morning already. So here's what one participant said. We've borrowed a modality, we've borrowed this, but we're really not even adhering to how in depth this modality goes into. There's parts of me and parts of my culture that are being stripped, borrowed, but not really much credit is given or respected. And another uh, therapist say, having someone as a clinician who's been an advocate for psychedelic healing to happen outside of the clinical container, because not only it will make that more accessible, but you're also not having to overcome some of the barriers that you would have to overcome in a clinical container, like stigma, safety, trust, rapport, etc." So as we begin to wrap up, this is our call to action to you. So being able to integrate psychedelic medicine, spirituality, and social justice, the link between psychedelic spirituality and social justice is essential. As I mentioned before, we can't talk about this without talking about social justice. The two go hand in hand. And so being able to achieve true integration of psychedelic spirituality necessitates a commitment to social justice principles. And so it is imperative 
psychedelic spirituality is not utilized to bypass issues around racial inequalities and white supremacy. And so when we talk about these steps, we acknowledge that the first one may be acknowledging that there's even systemic issues. So psychedelic experiences may lead individuals to a heightened sense of interconnectedness and unity, but it's essential not to leverage these experiences to minimize or ignore systematic issues related to race. And so the focus should be on understanding and addressing the root cause of social injustice and challenging oneself to eradicate these systems. Yeah. And so recognizing intersectionality. Psychedelic spirituality should not be wielded to diminish the unique challenges faced by individuals based on their racial or ethnic backgrounds. Embracing an intersectional perspective involves acknowledging and addressing the complex interplay of various social identities. Promoting inclusivity. So incorporating the integration of psychedelic experiences into spiritual practices should promote inclusivity and diversity. It's essential to create spaces that respect and honor different cultural, racial, and spiritual backgrounds rather than leveraging psychedelics to reinforce existing power dynamics or cultural appropriation. And engaging in self-reflection, right? Maybe one of the toughest things, but it's important those engaging in psychedelic spirituality challenge themselves to critically self-reflect, questioning their own biases, their advantages, their prejudices. This includes being aware of how personal experiences may differ from the experiences of others in different cultural backgrounds. And then last but not least, what it means to be a co-disruptor versus an ally. Rather than using psychedelic spirituality as a way to disengage from social justice initiatives or avoid having the hard conversations around race, individuals can utilize their experiences to fuel a commitment to disintegrate systems of oppression. And so this involves actively and intentionally participating in efforts to address racial disparities and promote equality. So to conclude, I think one of our participants put it best. What came to mind for me was a co-disruptor. A co-disruptor because that differentiates allyship as a costume. That's not to dismiss the efforts. Allyship on a policy level, but also from a personal level. If it presents with an agenda, then I'm less likely to want to be in connection with that brand of allyship. I think a co-disruptor, the evidence would be your hands are as dirty as mine. Are you going where I go? Are you having to repeatedly answer questions or to experience certain things, discomfort and harm, just like I am? Are you experiencing closed doors? If you're a co-disruptor and the evidence is how dirty your hands are, you're able to get into the work like me. Thank you very much, Kira, my friends. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And just as a note, if you have questions, make sure to note them down on a, your phone or something, so we'll come back to them later. And our second, our second speaker today is Julian Sanchez Gonzalez. He is a PhD candidate in art history at Columbia University and a research fellow at the Museum of Modern Art Cisneros Institute. Okay, good morning everyone. It is a great pleasure and an honor to be here with all of you. Many thanks to Paul and Jeffrey for the invitation and to all the people attending in person and also online. 
Today's gathering at Harvard Divinity School makes a case for the growing interest in psychedelic research and spiritual practices beyond disciplinary and regional boundaries. Together, we reflect on our shared need to shift our bodies of knowledge and our embodied experiences to create realities that we desire to live in and live through. Desire, psychedelics, and spiritualities are intrinsically linked. And thinking about them requires us to keep considering our bodies in relation to culture, and more poignantly, in relation to race and gender. This convening addresses, from an academic standpoint, a globalized phenomenon partially defining the sidegeist of our time. I'd like to contribute two insights to this panel on psychedelic spirituality and race. The first is to offer historical context to today's efforts by establishing a parallel between our convening and the First World Congress of Sorcery, a unique event celebrated in Bogota in 1975. The Congress, largely understudied in the intellectual and cultural histories of the countercultural era, is one of the case studies from my doctoral dissertation project in art history. Second, I'd like to consider the queering and liberating possibilities that the cross-cultural sacred or interspiritual can offer within the context of the Congress of Sorcery. My proposition roots the idea of sorcery, witchcraft, or brujeria as a form of spiritual promiscuity, highlighting its utopian qualities as well as individual and collective agency in cultural exchange. Congregating a reported number of 3,000 participants, the first World Congress of Sorcery, or Primer Congreso Mundial de Brujería, was as groundbreaking and problematic as a public event. Simón González Restrepo, a businessman with influential family ties in the arts and politics, initially devised the idea of this multi-pronged convening together with his former spouse, Claudia Restrepo. With the support of Colombian and German investors, Gonzalo Restrepo managed to organize a team of over 35 people from humanistic, scientific, and artistic backgrounds. Over the course of a year, part of this team worked at Gonzalo Restrepo's newly founded travel agency, La Rana, in downtown Bogota, which served as the Congress's operations headquarters. The Congress heralded the slogan, in the shadow of the unknown, with love and wonder, a phrase coined by the Colombian poet Gonzalo Arango. A transgressive figure in Colombian arts, Arango had been a student of Gonzalo Restrepo's father, the existentialist writer Fernando González Ochoa. By the 1970s, Arango had become increasingly distanced from, the, from his disruptive role as leader of the Nadaista avant-garde movement and was exploring a mystical and liturgic phase in the Caribbean archipelago of San Andres and Providencia. His time there was also marked by frequent visits to Ronald Willis Williams's home a local botanist and healer. Also known as El Brujo Pepa, Williams became a teacher and friend of the Nadaistas, including Gonzalo Restrepo, professing what he called the gospel of love. His teachings combined elements from Rastafarianism, Latin American left-wing politics, and Afro-diasporic herbalism. The poster of the event, designed by the, designed by the Spanish Colombian painter Alejandro Obregón Rosés, alluded on a surface level to the witch's flight in direction to the orgiastic rites of communion with the devil, or Sabbath. Following the medieval oral and iconographic conventions to represent this scene, the witch accompanied by the male goat, this composition captured a growing interest in occult spiritualities of a transnational countercultural movement. Further, as a publicity stunt, the Congress received widespread attention nationally and internationally gaining followers and also raising eyebrows for the elevated fees of its academic conference. A collective craze for participation ensued as the event also featured a witch fair, three art exhibitions, musical and ritualistic performances, film screenings, and theater displays. Whether by conviction of visibility or driven by monetary gains, the Congress proved to be a cultural phenomenon. Despite being loosely defined by Gonzalo Restrepo as sheer love and the energy of that which is immaterial, sorcery or witchcraft operated as an umbrella term for various leading studies and practices of non-hegemonic spiritual systems. This included voodoo, candomblé, Maria Leonza, Lumbalu, as well as astrology, parapsychology, hypnosis, Kirlian aura photography, sacred plants, demonic iconographies, and even extraterrestrial contacts. 
Witchcraft was thought of as an intercontinental, permeable platform that privileged unorthodox spiritual and scientific explorations, as well as a shared humanity in spite of notorious cultural differences. I have discussed elsewhere some of the events taking place during the First World Congress of Sorcery, including preliminary findings and major art exhibitions containing over 600 pieces. Today, I'd like to briefly bring to your attention two of the over 20 panelists invited to participate. Andrew T. Weil, a Harvard educated by, oh, sorry, I think I lost my turn here. Okay. Andrew T. Weil, a Harvard educated biologist and doctor who at the time of the conference worked as a researcher at the Harvard Botanical Museum, and Teresa E. Rode, a theologian from Mexico City, who had done a year-long doctoral fellowship here at Harvard Divinity School in 1959. By 1975, Rode had finished her doctoral program at the Universidad Autónoma de México and imparted classes on comparative religion at this same institution. The presence of Weil and Rode's writings in the proceedings memoirs provide crucial information of the countercultural networks across the Americas in the 1970s. Weil's positive use of plants, raised questions on how to, quote unquote, safeguard the magic of psychoactive substances, whether through rituals surrounding the use of the plant and having an awareness of its powers. Rode's Magic and World in Crisis asserted that, quote, the resurgence of magic, superstition, astrology, witchcraft, bloody cults, and divination of all kinds coincide with the worst socioeconomic crises that in turn are also of an ethical order. Both addresses present us with moral queries, though of a different nature, responding to the need of studying non-Western or non hegemonic epistemologies as necessary catalyzers for a larger social behavioral shift. One narrative prevents excess consumption of various drugs, including coffee and sugar, though lingering in static pasts of an indigenous, romanticized indigenous other. The second contends that the dismantling of Western Christian and scientific values desperately looks for alternatives that serve as, quote, palliatives of social anguish, such as the case of witchcraft. How much of this intellectual and ontological legacy do we carry today, I wonder? Can our theories and discursive tools help us supersede inadvertent essentialisms and binary thinking as scholars conjoining in the studies of psychedelics and spirituality? This is a pressing matter, particularly when considering the histories in which the, this very conversation is rooted, would we be open to accept and act on the idea that the research carried out by the scientists associated with the Harvard Psychedelic Club in South American locales was a form of biopiracy, as it has been dubbed in certain circles for its extractive, non-redistributive qualities. Further, if we take the model of spiritual returns laid out by Rode, as a factual historical recurrence, then the success of the political projects assembled in this room is contingent upon our capacity at implementing a widespread, non-positivist, anti-racist ontological shift. Easier said than done. The same year that the first Royal Congress of Sorcery was celebrated, American writer Annie Dillard won the Pulitzer Prize for general nonfiction for her book, A Pilgrim at Tinker Creek. This first person narrative recounts the author's year long walking journey across Virginia and ponders on themes related to transcendence and nature. The novel blends themes as described by Dillard from quote, Christianity, Judaism, Buddhism, and Sufism, attesting to what she has also attributed quite brilliantly to her spiritually promiscuous behavior. Interestingly enough, Gonzalo Restrepo's father, Fernando, also embarked in a walking journey of spiritual liberation from a Catholic Jesuit upbringing in the 1920s. His experience culminated in the acclaimed book, Viaje a Pie, a novel that rooted his authorial persona as a type of Andean nature-bound mysticism. The large idea of spiritual promiscuity has been revived, though somewhat shyly, in the last decade in a few spaces of worship across the US, as well as in prominent podcasts, namely Krista Tippett's On Being. Further, Brazilian minister Nancy Cardoso and theologian Claudio Cafalage have recently made use of the term to describe the Jurema ontologies and rituals from the northeastern region of Bahia in Brazil. 
For them, Jurema, an interracial religion rooted in plant-based cosmogonies, represent a, quote, spiritual promiscuity between indigenous people and spirits, black people and enchanted ones, as well as their oral nature. Moreover, Jurema, which was thought to be extinct decades ago, enables an Afro-indigenous, quote, solidarity and mystique, end of quote, against the lack of social recognition and territorial displacement. Promiscuity as solidarity and agency against settler colonialism is an enticing idea, though one that would have to be concerted as all intellectuals mo intellectual models with communities on the ground. Half a century apart, the large self-referential account and Cardoso and Carvalho's description of a reviving Afro form of Afro form of Afro-indigenous spiritual activism signal a form of interspirituality infused with feminism and critical race theory. At the core, they also share a theological ethos of human interconnectedness. This is precisely what Jamaican writer and cultural theorist Sylvia Winter has described as an imperative to acknowledge that which is ecumenically human and to learn to think transcosmogonically. In its theological political provocation, the recirculation of the term spiritual promiscuity becomes thorny, not only because it connotes banality and disinterest, but also because it continues to destabilize a modernist mindset grounded in sacred ideas of purity and homogeneity. Winter's plea following, following Franz Fanon is to upend the rationalist framework which considers the human as biologically bounded and to shift to a conception of humanity that's biological, yes, as well as linguistic, relational, and practiced. Why promiscuity and not syncretism, hybridity, or creolization? Though these terms have been discussed by others, Aimé Césaire and Edouard Glissant, I believe that their focus ultimately relies on processes and outcomes, and less so on intentions and effect. The promiscuous aims to shift our agency as individuals and collectives who are increasingly empowered both discursively and materially, to create our own realities. Profoundly utopian, yes. In fact, my aim is to establish a wordplay with Jose Esteban Munoz's adoption of the term cruising from his seminal book, Cruising Utopia, not as glamorized li libidinal excess, and this is crucial to my argument, but as a straddling between disciplines, realms, and regimes of perception. This term, this term also follows along Munoz's theorizing of the word queerness as a fundamental refusal of pre-established performatic forms of being human. In many ways, aligned with Winter's bios math, mythoid liberating diet, promiscuity expands Munoz's invitation to rejoice in ecstatic rapture and open-ended consciousness towards the other. For him, quote, queerness's time is the time of ecstasy. Ecstasy is queerness's way. As a discipline, art history's fallout with spirituality coincided with the prohibition around psychedelics in the 1980s, the AIDS pandemic worldwide, and the rise of neoliberal multiculturalism. This, as it was the case in other disciplines in the humanities, is no coincidence. It is exciting to see a shift in various institutions worldwide, including my own, where conversations on art and the spiritual can be held unapologetically, though, as it is also the case with radical racial and queer politics, there's still much ground to be covered. Given this decades-long lack of engagement with spirituality as a legitimate research subject, a great lacuna in content, theory, and methodology is pervasive in my field. This is greatly felt in our engagement with archival materials and the interpolation we allow ourselves to establish with living artists' experiences. I hope to have shown in this reading how the First Con World Congress of Sorcery, despite its contradictory grounding, which navigated the complexities of the New Age era, posited sorcery, witchcraft, or brujeria as an umbrella term manifesting a radical, spiritually promiscuous ethos. This serves as a cautionary tale for us to steer direction in our research and discussions. It is also a reminded, reminder of the need for ecstatic experiences and for storytelling as enablers of shifts in our ontological and epistemic regimes. 
This is an exciting and challenging time for a develop developing school of thought like this one, as we aim to resist unjustified social and biological hierarchies and to aptly respond to pressing global needs for increased social justice and sustainability. Thank you, and I look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you, Julian. And to bring us home, we have Grant Jones. Um, Grant is a contemplative musician and researcher who is currently a PhD candidate in psychology at Harvard University. He is also co-founder of the Black Lotus Collective. How's, how's everyone doing? Good, I'd love to hear it. Um, I'm so blessed and honored to be with you all here today um, on this incredible panel. Um, my name is Grant, um, and as mentioned, I'm a clinical psychology PhD student at Harvard. And today I'm gonna to tell you all a little bit about my research, um, naturalistic psychedelic use in health in communities of color. And for those of you who don't know, um, naturalistic psychedelic research relates to studying psychedelic use in real world non-clinical contexts. Before I jump in, I'm gonna give an overview of what I'm gonna to talk to you about today. I'm gonna to start with reviewing background information on psychedelics and health, as well as key gaps that I perceive within current clinical psychedelic research. I'll then get into the role of naturalistic psychedelic research in filling those gaps, and then I'll discuss my naturalistic psychedelic research. And then I'll discuss future directions for my work. So I know that we're at a conference of psychedelics, so I'm sure many of you know what these substances are, but in jumping into talks, I always like to give a definition just in case folks have joined who don't know um, what we're talking about. So um, psychedelics are substances that give rise to non-ordinary states of consciousness characterized by profound changes in mood and perspective. And these substances include substances like MDMA, um, which is an empathogen that's known to give rise to feelings of increased social connectedness and empathy, as well as classic psychedelics that are naturally occurring or derived, like the substance psilocybin, which is the active compound in magic mushrooms, which are known to give rise to uh, mystical type experiences that can have profound um, spiritual and personal, personal significance uh, for those who use them. And there have been a number of groundbreaking clinical trials in the past while that demonstrate the efficacy of psychedelics for a host of different mental health conditions. Mitchell et al. 2021, which was published in Nature Medicine, demonstrated that MDMA-assisted therapy uh, may be an effective treatment for uh, PTSD. And Davis et al. 2021, demonstrating that psilocybin-assisted therapy may be an effective treatment for major depressive disorder. However, given the outsized emphasis that I perceive that clinical trials have had on shaping the current psychedelic renaissance, I believe that these studies have left us with some really critical gaps within current clinical psychedelic research. The first is that clinical trials really have limited to no ecological validity, and ecological validity is another way of saying, do the findings generalize to the real world? So we have these trials that are conducted in really tightly controlled settings, but we don't actually know whether psychedelics, um, how psychedelics are linked to health outcomes when people are using them in real world contexts. And given the barriers um, that we've already started to discuss, uh, most people are using psychedelics outside of the clinic. So it's important for us to know how are they actually associated with health um, in real world settings. A second obvious critical limitation as well is their um, really ridiculous levels of uh, uh, um, uh, racial and ethnic homogeneity slash the limitations to diversity in psychedelic clinical trials. Um, a 2018 foundational review of psychedelic clinical trials, uh, Michaels et al. 2018 found that samples are often greater than 80% white and really often just uh, for uh, roughly four percent black or Hispanic and um, more recent psychedelic clinical trials unfortunately have been even more homogenous. Um, so taking all this together, it's very clear we have very little information about uh, the associations between psychedelic use and health in diverse communities. Um, and it's an essential gap, uh, I believe, to fill. This is where I believe naturalistic psychedelic research is essential for the coming psychedelic renaissance. Naturalistic psychedelic research, again, just to reground us in terminology, is studying psychedelic use in real world non-clinical contexts. Typically, naturalistic psych psychedelic research is in the form of online surveys or large epidemiological surveys, which uh, gather information from broad swaths of the population to better understand um, health outcomes and substance use patterns uh, within um, the population of interest. 
And uh, given that it's inherently rooted within the real world, such studies can address limitations to ecological validity, and also they can address the very obvious limitations to diversity in psychedelic research, as you can create online surveys directly designed to better understand health in diverse populations, and large epidemiological surveys are inherently representative by nature because they seek to gather, underst gather and understand information about health um, in populations at large. So now with all that back context around what the gaps that I perceive in current psychedelic research are, as well as the role of naturalistic psychedelic research in filling those gaps, I'll now discuss my research. Before I jump in, I want to give us a definition of a survey um, called the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, or the NISDA for short, as this is a survey that I've used to conduct most of my psychedelic research while I've been in graduate school. So this is a large epidemiological survey, like the type that I just named, and it collects information on substance use and health in a nationally representative sample of the United States. And every single year, it surveys roughly 50,000 Americans ages 12 years old and, and, ab and above. So it provides a really amazing chance to um, study psychedelic use in, in, um, in uh, a large sample. It includes thousands of variables on substance use and health, including psychedelics. So as I mentioned, a chance to study these substances further in depth. And an important caveat that I always want to name, and I'll name repeatedly, is that my research is cross-sectional. These data are cross-sectional, meaning that the data are gathered at a single point in time. And this is in contrast to longitudinal studies that's, uh, that uh, assess health and assess outcomes over multiple periods of time in a given study. And because it's cross-sectional, nothing that I'm going to discuss is causal. And so what that means is I can't say that psychedelics are causing changes in health in the population when I discuss my research. We're really just talking about the fact that psychedelic use is associated with various patterns um, at a correlational level. And it might be due to causality, but it might also be to um, variables that I might not have controlled for in my research. So I just always want to give that caveat up front. Now I want to discuss my first research paper in this area, Jones and Nock 2022A. And the core research question that I had in heading into this initial study was the following. How is MDMA and classic psychedelic use associated with psychological distress and suicidality at the population level? And I wanted to ask this question because a group of researchers, Hendricks et al. 2013, um, asked, um, looked at the data from the NISDA um, a while back and demonstrated that classic psychedelic use was associated with lowered odds of these outcomes. And so for me, this study was my attempt to not only replicate those prior findings using more up-to-date NISDA data, but also to assess whether that pattern of associations could also apply to MDMA as well. And so as I mentioned, I used data from the NISDA, this time more updated data, um, data ranging from 2008 to 2019, featuring a sample of over 484,000 people. I included adults ages 18 years and above in my research. The independent variables in my study, so the core uh, domains that I'm changing or manipulating, was assessing lifetime use of the following substances. And these uh, variables are binary, so whether somebody had or had not used these substances in their lives. MDMA, which is a substance that I named, and individual classic psychedelics, so psilocybin, LSD, which is synthesized from the ergot fungus, peyote, which is a psychoactive cactus, and mescaline, which is the primary psychoactive compound within peyote. The dependent variables of the core outcomes that I was assessing were also binary, so they fell into categories of whether somebody did or did not meet criteria for the following uh, mental health conditions. Past month's psychological distress, past year suicidal ideation, past year suicidal planning, and past year suicide attempts. And in my analyses, I controlled for various demographic factors such as age and sex, and I also controlled for lifetime use of various different substances like cocaine and pain relievers. And for those of you who aren't familiar, controlling for a given variable means that you're accounting for these variables when you're looking at the associations between the independent variable and the dependent variable. So it's over and above any of these demographic factors. Are these associations significant or not is what we're looking to see. The analytical approach that I used is something called logistic regression, and it's a modeling approach that's used specifically for binary dependent variables like the type in my analyses. And the core outcome that's yielded from a logistic regression model is something called an odds ratio. And an odds ratio is essentially just a measure of the strength of an association between an independent variable and a binary dependent variable like the type that I have within my studies. And so if an odds ratio is lower than one, that means that the independent variable is associated with lowered odds of the dependent variable occurring. And this is exactly what we were looking to see within my work. So are, are psychedelics associated with odds ratios lower than one for these dependent variables related to distress and suicidality? And so just to break this down even further, so let's say that in my study, I got an odds ratio where, where I looked at MDMA use, and if 
we see that lifetime MDMA use um, is associated with um, an odds ratio of 0.90 for pasture suicidal thinking. This would mean that individuals who have used MDMA within the population have 0.9 times the odds or 10% lowered odds of having experienced suicidal thinking than somebody who had not used MDMA. And again, this isn't a causal association, so I'm not saying that MDMA is causing um, reductions in suicidal thinking. I'm saying if you look at somebody who has used MDMA in the population versus somebody who has not, the person who's used MDMA is going to have roughly 10% lowered odds on average of having um, uh, of suicidal thinking within the past year. So again, I always just want to parse that correlation versus causation um, distinction that exists within my work. So what was, what was the key finding from, from all of this, from all of this um, uh, investigation? The key finding is that indeed in alignment with my hypotheses, lifetime MDMA and psilocybin use were associated with lowered odds of psychological distress and suicidality. Specifically, MDMA was associated with lowered odds of past year suicidal thinking and past year suicidal planning. And psilocybin was associated with lowered odds of past month psychological distress and past year suicidal thinking. Very importantly, all of the other substance use covariates that I included, all the other substance use variables, they either didn't share any associations with these outcomes or conferred increased odds of these outcomes. So we're really seeing that psilocybin and MDMA stand alone in terms of their pattern of protective associations with these outcomes, whereas all other substances either weren't significant or actually were increasing odds of these outcomes. After this first paper, what I've also sought to do was not only replicate this pattern of results for MDMA and psilocybin in major depressive episodes, which is Jones and Off 2022B, my second research paper in this area, but that I, I subsequently published a host of different papers demonstrating the same pattern of protective associations for psychedelics. So for instance, demonstrating that psilocybin is associated with lower odds of crime arrest, demonstrating that psilocybin is associated with lower odds of opioid use disorder, of nicotine use disorder, um, MDMA being associated with lower odds of uh, um, social impairment, for instance. So um, really seeking to regularly uh, demonstrate that psychedelics are associated with, um, with uh, these lowered odds. So those are my first two steps. One, demonstrate the association for psychedelics and psychological distress and suicidality. Second, replicate that pattern of results for many different outcomes. A core um, investigatory direction that I always had in mind and heading, into, and heading into this work was really to seek to explore how race and ethnicity might impact these associations. Because with a sample as large as the type that I have, it actually represents a really unique opportunity to ask questions, really granular questions about the associations between psychedelics and health for different racial and ethnic groups that might be impossible to ask within the current landscape on clinical trials. So um, this was a, a, a research direction that I always uh, wanted to go in and that I have been fortunate in graduate school to be able to do. So Jones and Ock 2022E and Jones and 2023A were two of my first research papers uh, within this area to explore the intersection of race, ethnicity, psychedelics, and health at the population level. And these studies explored whether race and ethnicity impact associations between lifetime use of MDMA and psilocybin as the independent variables, and psychological distress, suicidality, and major depressive episodes as the dependent variables. So as you all can tell, a very clear uh, follow on from my prior work. I again use NISDA data with Jones and Nock 2022E, um, exploring psychological distress and suicidality as the main outcomes. And this used NISDA data from 2008 to 2019. Jones 2023A uh, explored major depressive episodes as the um, core outcomes with lifetime, past year, and past year severe major depressive episodes representing the core dependent variables. And this used NISDA data from 2005 to 2019, um, featuring a sample of over 596,000 individuals. So the statistical approach that I used within these studies was largely the same as the one that I described in my prior work. So using logistic regression models to assess the associations between psychedelic use and these health outcomes. But the core difference in this study, um, in these studies that I want to name and discuss is that I was conducting moderation tests this time. And a statistical moderation is another way of asking, does the strength of the relationship between two variables such as psilocybin as the independent variable and depression as a dependent variable, depend on the value of a third variable, such as race or ethnicity. And put even more simply, is the relationship between psilocybin and depression gonna be different if you're one race versus another race, for instance? 
And so um, when I conducted these moderation tests, the key finding that I found was that indeed the moderation tests were significant. So we're seeing, probably unsurprising to many folks in this room, that race and ethnicity are indeed impacting the associations between psychedelics and health. But I didn't stop there. I also want to go a step further to examine what are the specific associations that psychedelics share with health outcomes for different racial and ethnic groups. So when I did th these analyses, I found that MDMA and psilocybin were associated with lowered odds of the aforementioned outcomes for white participants, which follows exactly in line with my prior published work and also with the clinical uh, literature within this area. But when I did this um, same exercise for participants of color, and this is really the core, um, the core finding that I want everyone in this room to take home if you remember nothing else, um, is that there were actually fewer and weaker associations between psychedelics and health among populations of color, which even though, again, it's not causal and it's just a correlational study, this raises extremely important questions around whether you'd see similar moderation effects within the clinic. Um, are we seeing that um, psychedelics and health are sharing different associations with the health outcomes that we're looking to test when we're, when we're examining these substances um, in specifically treatment-based contexts? We don't know because um, psychedelic clinical trials aren't representative, but it is is now imperative, it now begs the question of uh, what um, would the impact of race and ethnicity be on psychedelics and health within, um, within treatment settings. So taking all this together, I, I really quickly want to discuss um, some of the future directions that I have that um, I want to and plan to take based on um, my, my research. So first and foremost, um, as a basic you know, first next step, I want to conduct additional cross-sectional studies of psychedelic use in communities of color. As I mentioned, I've, I've published a host of different papers uh, uh, demonstrating protective associations between psychedelics and various health and behavior outcomes, but I've only conducted moderation tests on a small number of those outcomes. So I want to have that be the first step that I take um, going forward. Next, I want to conduct the longitudinal studies to really demonstrate um, and investigate how psychedelics might be um, impacting health in diverse communities over time, because that can start to generate causal information about the impact of psychedelics on health in diverse populations. I want to conduct qualitative studies to just better understand the lived experiences of individuals of color who are using psychedelics within the current moment. Again, a massive gap that we really don't have much information on at all within clinical research. And finally, I want to take all of this information to um, really craft safe, effective um, treatments, uh, psychedelic-assisted therapeutic paradigms for diverse communities so, with, so that we can make sure that the current psychedelic renaissance can actually be of benefit for people from all different backgrounds. Thank you so much, and I'm willing to take it. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you to our pan panelists, and we're going to open it up for questions now. Um, this this might be uh, thank you that was fabulous um, and this may be something I'm looking for informed speculation but I was thinking with the last study you presented about whether intentionality and in set and setting or uh, what I would almost think of is faith in the thing changing for you whether that might play a role in uh, in the in the ver in the variable that race produces yeah thank you so much for that question and um, I totally agree with that line of um, inquiry and that possibility and many of um, the uh, discussion in in papers you have discussion sections where you hypothesize why you found what you found and in my discussion sections for those papers I discuss exactly that so the fact that Folks of color likely doing uh, psychedelics in real world contexts almost certainly have different mindsets heading into the experience and almost certainly are doing them in different contexts um, than our folks um, who are of European descent or who are white. Um, again, inf massive gap that we just really don't have much information on at all, um, but definitely, again, another one of the directions that I hope um, to, that this research can tee up. So thank you so much for, um, for tuning in to something that I also uh, my one of the next directions for, for my work. And we have a question over there in the green. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm curious if um, any analysis has been done across all the studies. There's so many studies going on, and even though the, perspect uh, the percentage of um, BIPOC is very low, I'm curious if any analysis has been done of the BIPOCs across those studies to see any trends that could speak to causes of that. Is that for me? Yeah, who, who, all right, do you have a specific person in mind? Oh, um, or, anyone, and, I, yeah, I know or everyone in, <laughs> yeah. involved in research in a different way. I'm just curious for anyone. 
Okay. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm happy. I'm happy to answer from what I know, and of course, anyone else on the panel can feel free to weigh in after me. Um, there have been some um, meta analyses of um, looking at treatment effects of psychedelic use for diverse populations. I know that um, I think last year um, there was a. Uh, a, um, a meta-analysis that looks specifically at MDMA-assisted therapy trials um, to examine ethno-racial potential differences in treatment effects. I don't think that meta-analysis found anything significant, so I think that um, there were no significant moderation tests for that specific um, line of inquiry, but that being said, they also discussed how um, they were underpowered because even when you collapse all the psychedelic clinical trials that have been done, there's not m many participants of color to conduct um, significant moderation tests in the first place. So it's kind of been kind of, it's, it's, um, it's, the research is so constrained because so little has been done that um, I, I feel like I always come home to the fact that it's really just a wide open field in which we have so much to learn and so little that we actually know. Um, so uh, hopefully can examine it in the future. And I'll pause here. Do any other do panelists have a, a add-on, or we can go to the next question? We can, okay. Yes. Um, who would right right next? Yep. Yeah. Hey, uh, thank you. First of all, um, so one thing that I know is a a core uh, core trauma across uh, Black and Indigenous communities. Um, and when I say Indigenous, I also include uh, many Latin Americans. Um, because that is a large part of our identity. Um, but a, a core part of the uh, trauma in these communities is intergenerational and epigenetic. And I'm, I'm curious about what kind of information you gather about people's histories to try to kind of find a correlation there. Because um, maybe some of that difference in efficacy is because of factors that have been encoded in our, in our, in our, in our, in our bodies over many generations, over hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. Candice, would, I'm thinking Candice Yvonne, would you like to start us off with that? So <clears throat> this is such a fascinating question. And um, I mean, I can answer from a clinical perspective and just valid, validate what you're saying, you know, that um, uh, in people's subjective experience, we see uh, that a lot of intergenerational trauma is processed in psychedelic assisted therapy. Um, and, and I don't know if that is uh, increased in BIPOC population. That's a great question. I think that we need to, to, to explore. Um, so, it, so I think it's, it's, you know, it, it feels true clinically, certainly. I don't think that, I don't know any data about that and certainly not, I'm not expert in uh, epigenetics studies. But um, I think it would be really, really interesting to, to, to look into this. Yeah. And I'll just say, I think from a, a clinical uh, trial perspective, even just from like an outpatient mental health setting, you know, doing intake, I think it's important that, right, while we're serving clients who may be coming to us for like ketamine treatment or, you know, even in underground practices that we ask about this, you know, as part of their history, because it's not uncommon, right, with this participant that we acknowledged at the very beginning of our presentation, right, her ancestors came forward, and part of that was also trying to connect with um, some grief around uh, an ancestor who had passed away. And so I think it's important that we're asking these questions, right, because it's not just our clients that are showing up in the room, but it's also their lineage and their heritage that's also showing up in the room, including our own as, uh, I would say, therapists as well. I, I just want to add one thing to um, something that stood out for me in talking to other people from Black and Indigenous communities is, um, sometimes it's as small as, do you even know the name of your grandparents? Um, and, and so, like, yeah, there's multiple ways to get that. And, and from a medical perspective, you know, there probably could be a lot to explore there. I'm just kind of curious, like, yeah, what are you gathering there in general? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. We'll go way to the back. And just oh, yeah. going back oh, to yeah. the, the idea of the body, um, a lot of uh, what happens in the psychedelic experience for people in, uh, in the psychedelic session might happen at the body level uh, that is beyond the verbal of the cognitive. And um, so I think it's important to attune to that and to support that, maybe to prepare people for that as well. And so uh, whether that is related to what the body um, has uh, encoded, you know, in terms of information and trauma, 
I think it's a great question as well to hold. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for your presentation. My question is around training, especially for BIPOC potential practitioners. You all have talked all kind of about this indigenous nature of these practices. So what do you see as the most decolonial route into the psychedelic field from your varied perspectives? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, who would like to start there? <laughs> I was going to say decriminalization, you know, uh, legalization and community-based trainings uh, by, you know, I mean, that's my simple answer, but. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, it's dismantling the model together. Um, and I think being able to come from a framework that is anti-oppressive um, and, you know, one of the, I would say the notions that I receive from my colleagues is even just having input, right? Because there are a lot of models that are be, being created from the top down, but they're not including the people on the ground who are holding the space. Um, so that's partially my answer to, yeah, community-based models. I also want to mention the, the, the film that just came out, came out, a documentary film called um, A Table of Our Own that shows very interesting um, emergence of training in the BIPOC communities uh, around psychedelic practices. So really encourage you to look for this. Okay, our next question up. Oh. Oh, okay, we have a few from online. Yeah, there's a number of questions in the online chat, so I'm gonna I'll start with one and then I'll ask a, a follow up after that. The, this first question is um, is really for any panelist, and it it's uh, a question regarding ego death that can sometimes be experienced during the psychedelic trip. And this question asker uh, says that they, their understanding of ego death is that it's defined as a complete loss of subjective identity, and that's leading them to wonder if whether or not um, there is some sort of what they say an antagonistic relationship to. Um, identity um, as we're talking about here and thinking about broadly and this sort of understanding of ego death. And I'm curious if any of the panelists have a different understanding of ego death or how these sort of, this loss of identity that maybe is experienced, how that intersects with race. Mm. <laughs> Just a small question. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> 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 I tackle that one. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I guess that's uh, cultural is like the big question. Um, I feel that a way that culture internationally in the 1980s tried to grasp with that idea of the irresolute identities uh, was to embark into the neoliberal model of multiculturalism, which created very strict categories in which each identity could find a place within society. Um, and that sense of order created visibility and representation, but at the same time created this kind of like golden cage, um, identitary uh, structures in which uh, we are now seeing the problems of. Um, so the, the, the kind of like notion of interconnectedness and intersections, uh, even to your introduction, Jeffrey, when you mentioned Kimberly, Kimberly uh, Crenshaw, um, has to do a lot with that. You know, um, I think that a form of ego death would be exceeding those categories, exceeding those identitary limitations, and try to see ourselves into that, what I mentioned the, in, the, in, my, in, my, in my presentation, it's like static idea of interrelation with each other. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's like from a historical standpoint, I think that could be something interesting to, to explore. Yeah. Correct, thank you. Um, the next set of questions, I'm just gonna lump a few questions here together, which are specifically thinking about um, wealth uh, as, a, as a factor in the success of psychedelic uh, treatments or therapies. And I'm curious if um, there's been any research that you are all familiar with about the ways in which sort of privilege or access are changing outcomes or future studies that you could imagine looking at something like that. I can speak a little bit about, just a little bit. Um, 
something that I want to um, explore within future work is definitely the intersection of um, socioeconomic status, race, and the outcomes that I described. So you can conduct three-way moderation tests in which you look at how multiple different variables um, intersect with one another to um, to assess um, their impact on uh, psychedelics and health. So I want to do that. I don't have um, any information about that. And I think it's, again, another wide open um, domain of inquiry. Um, I think it's really um, in this moment of, you know, um, psychedelic hype, um, which is um, has a lot of promise. I, I think it can sometimes get lost, like just how little we know <laughs> and just how little we know about particularly the intersection of structures and psychedelic use and health. Um, so wide open. So great question. Don't have any information, but want to want to explore further. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll take a few more questions from the in-person audience. Yes. Yes, thank you. Um, in particular, Grant and Candice, I need a little help with this one. There's something that you each mentioned that put together, I think, needs some attention. Uh, Grant, you talk about uh, naturalistic studies that are sort of in the wild rather than a clinical setting. Uh, and Candice uh, and Yvonne both mentioned um, trust among persons of color, black people, and indigenous peoples because of things like MKUltra. And those intersect, like I grew up in Philadelphia where uh, people, in order to get bail if they were arrested for something, would sign up for an MKUltra LSD analog experiment to get their bail money. And that caused this great d distrust in the area. And as kids, we saw what were obviously experimental drugs from things like that out on the street in huge quantities. They were experimenting. and. When it's, um, our institution goes and sues government agencies for deprivation of rights under a color law for these kind of activities. But how, we, we saw a, a mob hitman, Sammy Gravano, was under witness protection, under the FBI's protection, had literally cornered the underground market in MDA in the United States for a time. How do we know when what you think is naturalistic isn't just uh, an ex a sick experiment? And what can we do to counter this where we detect it? So that's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, but I think it's important to acknowledge that these experiments have existed. So even when I had participants coming into a study, I acknowledge that, right? I acknowledge that I am part of a system that has historically oppressed you. I acknowledge that I come in with a certain amount of power and privilege and advantage. So let's talk about what does that feel like even from a preparation standpoint to be in this space knowing that historically you have been oppressed. And if it's not you, it's people in your lineage, it's people in your community. And so I think that is just you know something that as an anti-oppressive therapist and clinician, and I would say safekeeper of this space, is just to acknowledge that. And I find that oftentimes people don't want to acknowledge that, uh, which continues to perpetuate the mistrust of the system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much for that beautiful answer that I resonate so deeply with. Um, and one thing that I'll um, kind of add from my uh, perspective as a clinical psychology researcher is, um, it's very easy for me to get overwhelmed with um, the amount of uh, the number of structural barriers that exist towards creating um, safe and uh, safe, effective uh, psychedelic containers for um, for diverse populations. And so, for me, I also uh, I try to take my uh, my role within this work one step at a time. Um, I try to do what I can um, little by little and be very honest about the limitations of what I can and can't conclude about what I'm doing. Um, and I feel like in that, for me, that's um, just a form of honesty. I also think something, an, an undercurrent about what um, has existed within um, psychedelic research as it's been conducted um, historically is that it wasn't honest. Um, it was um, it was extractive, um, but saying that it was providing benefit, um, it was um, harmful, saying that it was potentially going to um, provide provide uh, prov provide a health benefit. Um, so for me, I I try my best to be in a personal practice of uh, of being clear 
about what I can and can't say from my work, about where it does and doesn't reach. And what I, and I try to keep everything just very small um, because what I'm doing is very small and what I've done is very small and very limited um, within a sea of what there is to know. Um, but for me, I, I think the what I trust in is the more that I do this incremental work, um, being clear about what I can and can't do, I can start to slowly, um, we can get into this practice of di dissolution, of dissolving um, these very calcified ways of, um, of understanding and relating to psychedelics that have um, been rooted in paradigms that are meant to, to harm others and to exclude others. And slowly we can start to um, gently, but powerfully, I think, um, disrupt uh, systems that aren't meant to serve everybody. So that's my personal um, practice that I'm in. We'll see how it goes. Yeah. Yeah. And we are at time. We have more questions that unfortunately we have time for. So please take those questions. We're going to have lunch soon and be able to discuss them with the community we have gathered here today as a way to wrap up and show appreciation. One question left that I wanted to ask. Um, so in like one or two sentences, what is it that you um, either would want people to take away from this, like one piece of knowledge or a question for them to be wrestling with or that we're wrestling with, um, or a call to, ac to action? What are the first steps to starting the journey to becoming a co-disruptor in this space? So from each one of you, we'll start with Yvonne and go down the table. The only thing I'd advise is that I just want to say thank you for being here. And, uh, and thank you for watching, questioning. And just, I think for me, what's important is to continue to ourselves in that space. I think I would just say, do your work mm -hmm. to dismantle white body supremacy. It lives in all of us. Um, and I think someone put a great analogy out there and it just said white body supremacy is not the shark in the water, but it's the water that engulfs the shark. So. Mm -hmm. um, I would say read Afro-Caribbean theory and cultural theorists they have a really beautiful, important key to understand this conversation. And yeah, very prescient um, investigations and research that have been conducted since the 1980s. So yeah, that would be my advice. Yeah. Um, is this supposed to be advice that we're giving or is it just a one to sentence yeah. reflection? Whatever, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. like something, right, cool. a takeaway, yeah, yes. action, oh, cool. you, you, you define it. All right, cool. So yeah, I, two sentences came to mind. I think um, one is, yeah, there's so much to explore. There's so much more to know. Um, and I um, invite folks to come on this come on the journey to supporting this work. And then also uh, just a, a quick call to, to resource in this work as well. It's something that we just uh, kind of touched on, but um, there needs to be a lot more resources devoted to enabling psychedelic um, studies and psychedelic treatments for diverse groups, period. I'm gonna pass it to Jeff <laughs> for, lunch, for lunch details, but before then, please join me in thanking our panelists, snaps, claps, call out. Thank you. Sponsor. Center for the Study of World Religions. Copyright 2024, the President and Fellows of Harvard College.